<laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh, mighty Savior, our great shepherd, the Lion of Judah, all that you are, Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for the privilege of gathering, gathering together and pondering your word. And Lord, may we not just take it into our heads and listen and maybe verbalize things. Lord, may it embed itself deeply in our hearts and spirits so that when we go out into a hurting, mourning world, you, through us, can make a difference. And so, Lord, I commit this lesson to you. Holy Spirit, we are asking for you to be the teacher and be amongst us this morning. I pray that you would speak individually to our hearts what we need to hear from the scripture. And um, we just commit this morning to you. And may we walk out of here this morning changed women because we have been with you. We thank you, Jesus, that you would love us so much. Amazing love, amazing grace that you have for us, that you would give us your word, truth, that we can live by. And so, Lord, we commit again this, this morning to you. We thank you and praise you for who you are, mighty King, mighty Lord of our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. amen. So <clears throat> I, I just was amazed at God's timing this week because haven't we been <clears throat> kind of thinking about mourning all week? As we have, I mean, individually, we've seen a family mourning, we've seen a nation mourning. I'm talking about uh, the homegoing of Queen Elizabeth. 70 years, am I right on that? Yeah. Facts check me. Seven decades of leadership in a, a, an amazing way. And we've watched mourning, we've seen national mourning, we've seen international mourning. And then also, you know, as we think about that, not only that, personal mourning. We see that in our own lives, we see it in lives of our friends, we see it in family members, and on and on it goes. And that is what we call circumstantial mourning. Mourning over tragedy, mourning over difficulty, mourning over heartbreak, mourning over the things that happen to us because, why? We live in a fallen, sinful world. And until we walk through the gates of heaven, we're going to have cords hanging off our arms. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, until we walk through the gates of heaven, we are going to have circumstantial mourning. And I hate to say that to us, but it's truth. Every one of us at different times in our life are going to have things that we deal with that are heartbreaking, heavy, difficult in our lives. And the good news is when we have the mourning that Jesus is talking about, when we get to heaven, there will be no more tears, no more mourning, no more tragedy, no more difficulty, no more pain. And we, at that point in time, will live eternally with our mighty King Jesus. So we have that to look forward to, don't we? But meanwhile, we've got circumstantial mourning. But, this, but circumstantial mourning is not what Jesus is talking about in this passage. It's a different kind of mourning. I want to share with you a story, that um, a true story, and some of you may have heard of it. And uh, it just really is a description of the kind of mourning that Jesus is talking about in this verse that we're going to look at today. Chuck Colson, in his brilliant book of essays, Who Speaks for God? I don't know if any of you have read that, but anything that Chuck Colson writes is worth reading, isn't it? But anyway, it says, tells of a, a watching a segment of television, 60 Minutes, remember that? Yeah. Um, in which host Mike Wallace interviewed Auschwitz survivor Yahil Denur a principal witness in the Nuremberg War Crime Trials. And you remember that. Um, I don't think any of us were alive, surely. Please help us know that we weren't. But anyway, um, that was the, <clears throat> the trial where they brought in all of the uh, criminals who were responsible for thousands upon thousands of Jewish people being imprisoned and, and killed and you know all the horror of what happened in Nazi Germany during World War II. And this 
uh, this gentleman that we're going to read about was a principal witness in the trial where these uh, people were coming in to be tried for war crimes. During the interview, a film click, clip from Adolf Eichmann's 1961 trial was viewed that showed Denur entering the courtroom and coming face to face with Eichmann for the first time since being sent to Auschwitz almost 20 years early. Stopped cold, Denur began to sob uncontrollably and then fainted while the presiding judge pounded his gravel for order. Was Denur overcome by hatred, fear, horrid memories, asked Colson, who then answers, no. It was none of these. Rather, as Denur explained to Wallace, all at once, once he realized Eichmann was not the godlike army officer who had sent so many to their deaths. This Eichmann was an ordinary man. I was afraid about myself, said Denur. I saw that I am capable to do this. I am exactly like him. Wow. Wallace's subsequent summation of Denur's terrible discovery, Eichmann is in all of us, is a horrifying statement, but it indeed captures the central truth about man's nature. For as a result of the fall, sin is in each of us. Not the susceptibility to sin, but sin itself. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. That's what we, Jesus is addressing in this uh, passage. And I think all of us have this tendency, like this man, not to want to face that evil uh, that we, we know is present in all of us, that all of us have the capability for in, inflicting pain on the people around us. In fact, it's easier to call it evil instead of calling it evil or sin. We instead like to say, well, you know, I made a mistake. I slipped up. I, I wasn't having a, a very good day, so naughty me. And we tend to minimize the fact of what our lives can look like and some of the things that we are capable of doing in our lives. Our problem is that we often compare ourselves down. And we say, okay, I did that, but you know what? Well, she's a lot worse than I am. You know, at least I don't do that. And we tend to compare ourselves down rather than taking the responsibility of some of our actions and thoughts and manners of doing things. Instead, we should be comparing ourselves up. Like in Isaiah 6, verse 1 and 2, we read this last week, when he had a vision of the Lord, and he says this in the first verse, in the year of King Uzziah, the, king that, the year that that King Uzziah, I'll get it out yet, <clears throat> died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, with a capital K, the Lord of hosts. He was comparing himself up, rather than comparing himself down, saying, well, not as bad as this. He was looking at the, the glory, the majesty, the goodness, the mercy, the grace, the love of mighty, almighty God, and immediately he saw his need for forgiveness. When we see the awesome holiness of God, we begin to get a realistic perspective, perspective on the gravity of who we really are. I remember as a little child when we would have family devotions, uh, in the day we always read out of the King James Version, and I remember that um, we would get to the word sin, and it didn't say sin, it said iniquity. And you know, you hear that word iniquity, and it was like, what? That just sounds horrible. And um, you know, it's not a word that we banter around that much now. You know, have you done any iniquity today? Uh, we don't kind of ask that question, fortunately, I think. But <laughs> anyway, but in fact, we aren't even comfortable using the word sin sometimes in our life, are we? Um, you know, and I know that all of us, you know, we, we kind of are more like, oh, I've had a bad day, I, I'm, I'm annoyed or irritable, or, you know, I said something mean or worse, but hey, I'm not so bad. 
again, comparing ourselves down, not so bad as that person. Um, and so that is where we, there needs to be a solution to our sin problem in order for us to have a relationship with him. Because what we want to do is, ha is have an understanding of, about ourselves and how we compare up to Almighty God. That's what this passage is all about. Praise God that he had a solution to our sin problem, didn't he? And that solution was in the person of Jesus. He sent his only son to cover for our iniquity. <laughs> and Jesus knew what we need to have an encounter with our iniquity. And to that end, he addresses the issue in Matthew 5, 4. Look with me at that verse. That's where we're going to part today. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The intimate connection of the second beatitude with the first is incredible. They build on each other. Last week, in verse 3, we learned about blessed are the poor in spirit. And that was primarily intellectual when we realize that we are poor in spirit. It was something we understand about ourselves. And then this week in verse 5, blessed are they that mourn is the emotional counterpart. It's the emotional response to what we know about ourselves. Um, mourning in this, the way that Jesus is using this here, is when we realize because of our poor in spiritness that we have, that we are to mo mourn. It is expressing what we feel about that poverty in spirit. And the beauty of this is that the surgery, remember we talked about how the Sermon on the Mount is like surgery in our life where it cuts away this, the superfluous and the things that don't count, the things that are irrelevant in our life, leaving um, more and more deeply the joy that we can have in our relationship with God. The pain of this is necessary for us to understand the joy of knowing God. Jesus wants us to see our need so that we will run to him in our desperation because we understand our iniquity. We're going to say that to each other for the rest of the study, okay? Iniquity, we're going to use that word a little bit. Anyway, how do we see our spiritual bankruptcy to, to truly live? We can then, when we see that, when we see how spiritually bankrupt we are, then we can live with joy. When I was a little girl, you know that I grew up in, in Japan, and we had something in our living room that was called a shoji. And it was, it, it was a doorway that would slide, beautiful. It was uh, made out of um, processed paper, and, but usually beautiful paintings on it. It was a gorgeous um, doorway that you slid open and then you closed it and so forth. And um, I'll never forget, I had to be under nine, so I was probably six or seven or something. And um, I walked in one day and I looked at the shoji and I thought, oh, there's a little spot on there. So I went over and I started kind of, you know, is that a bug or something? I started picking on it and all of a sudden it was a little hole. <laughs> and so as I'm trying to figure out what in the world, the hole suddenly became from a little pin to about the size of a penny. And then as I'm freaking out and trying to figure out what to do, it became quarter size. <laughs> and so this very, I'm sure expensive, beautiful uh, doorway, I had put a quarter hole in it. And so what did, what did I do as a like six, seven year old? Raced out of the living room as quickly as I could go, ran upstairs. And a few minutes later, my mom walked into the living room and she goes, what? There's a hole the size of a quarter in the shoji. And so she goes, Slade, my younger brother, please come in here. So my younger brother walks in and she, she said, why did you, what is this? Why did you do this? He goes, oh, mom, I, I didn't do that. And she said, Slade, okay, I'm going to pull this chair up. I want you to sit down in front of this hole and I want you to sit there until you admit to me that you tore the shoji. Meanwhile, upstairs, 
I'm thinking, what is going on down there? And I walk downstairs, and here's my little brother sitting in front of the hole that I made, being punished for, I'm going to get cry telling you the story. <laughs> anyway, um, I still feel the emotion. But um, anyway, and I was devastated because I was guilty. He was being punished. And, and I grieved over what I had caused in my sweet little brother's life. Who, had, who could do things, but this was not his. But anyway, and so I, I went and found my mother, and I said, Mom, I have to tell you, tell you something. I, I was the one that put the hole in the shoji not slayed, whereupon I, I did get punished. But when she forgave me, and I was able to live through my punishment, I was like, oh. the joy, the relief from mourning my sin. That's what Jesus is talking about. You know, I think as children, uh, little children have more of a sweet sensitivity to that kind of thing and can quickly respond. I wish that we all had that sensitivity to when we do something wrong, that we just suffer, suffer, suffer over something we've done. But anyway, that is what Jesus is going to talk about. How do we mourn so that we are blessed? What does that all mean? So the next point on your outline, what is the paradox of mourning our sin. First, to understand what is mourning, we begin with, as we're looking at it, A, what mourning is not. What mourning is not. Jesus is not saying, blessed are the miserable, grim face, carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. You just ate a lemon and you can't get it out of your mouth. Look on your face, pious. He doesn't want that. He's not saying that. Uh, and don't you know people like that that say, oh, yes, I... Uh, I'm a Christian, and life is hard here. <laughs> and we know people like that, that are like carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. I'll never forget years ago when we had first come to Sheridan House, and we had just employed a, a new uh, woman to work in the office, and she, she said, what is going on in this place? All this laughter, all this teasing each other? And she was horrified that we had joy. And she just felt like, as a Christian, we need to walk around, you know, piously. Yes, we live in a deeply troubling times with serious concerns, but here it is. We know who is totally in control. We know exactly who is in control. The other side of the coin of the pious lemon eating people <laughs> is that we have to be careful not to overreact in the other direction, afraid to seem over, pri uh, over pious. So we want to be giddy and goofy and fun all the time. And um, it's, it's as if we're saying, um, you know, if I said that I was having a bad day today, um, and my heart is hurting and everything, that wouldn't sound very pious and godly, so I'm just going to be happy all the time. That is equally wrong, isn't it? We had a greeter in our church years ago, and he was always stationed at one door. And when you'd go through his door, and he'd say, good morning, how are you? And you'd say, fine, how are you? And he'd say, fantastic. Yeah. And every Sunday, he'd say, fantastic. And I don't know about you all, but my every days aren't always fantastic. There are days that are not. And so um, I, I just was, that was interesting to me that he would express it that way. So what we're saying is mourning is not about outward demeanor. It is not about outward demeanor. Number two, mourning is also not sorrow over our circumstances. We talked about that uh, as we started. Yes, we mourn over circumstances. We have circumstantial mourning. Yes, of course, we mourn over those things. And of course, Jesus is aware of our grieving hearts and is there to comfort and sustain us. A, a friend recently said to me, my heart is broken. Things are just not good in my life. But in the midst, I feel his peace. I feel his peace. Yes, we suffer. We, are, we mourn over the things that are going on in our life. But, and God knows about that. Uh, that is so true, and scripturally, there are so many, so many verses on comfort, and you might want to jot these down. Um, they are just very strong verses that when we are going through the circumstantial mourning, 
these verses are so incredibly helpful. Psalm 23, verse 4, you know this one by heart. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 119, 76, may your unfailing love be my comfort. Zechariah 1, 17, and the Lord will again comfort Zion. Isaiah 40, 17, for the Lord comforts his people. Isaiah 51, there are a lot in Isaiah 51, 12, I am, I, even I am he who comforts you. 66, 13, as a mother comforts you, so will I comfort you. 2 Corinthians, New Testament, 1, verse 3 and 4, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. 2 Corinthians 7, 6, God who comforts the downcast comforts us. Many, many, that's just a, a touching of the verses that talk about how, yes, God is totally aware of our circumstantial suffering, totally aware of our circumstantial mourning and is there to comfort us in those things in our lives. However, this one, this blessed mourning is something all together different. This mourning, the kind that Jesus is mentioning in this passage, has nothing to do with our natural life circumstances because the Beatitudes have to do with our spiritual attitudes our spiritual attitude. This is a spiritual mourning. What is it? Well, be on your outline. Mourning is, number one, mourning is grief over personal sin. It is a great day in our lives when we see our iniquity and mourn over, and here it is, the devastating impact it has not only on our souls, words, deeds, and here it is, others around us. When we sin against the Lord, it affects people that we do not even realize. It does not just affect us personally. It has effect on people around us, our family, our relatives, neighbors, workplace, whatever it is, it, is effect, it doesn't just affect us. It's a great day when we refuse to rationalize them and acknowledge them for what they truly are, not mistakes or shortcomings or a bad mood or oh naughty me. We can never truly experience joy until we are deeply convicted of personal sin. If that's a struggle, ask God to allow you to soften your callous heart to see your sin as it is. Say, Lord, okay, I'm, I've gotten a little bit callous about the way I react to that person or to that situation, please help me to see it for what it is, what I am doing, how I am uh, wounding you who loves me so much and gave yourself for my sin. Help me to get that, grasp that. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know if you have been there, but I certainly have, that sometimes we see such gross sins all around us that we don't grieve over what we consider minor sins. <laughs> oh Lord, you know, I know I'm a sinner and this little attitude, but at least I'm not like her. <laughs> at least mine's a minor sin. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Please nod your head because it'll make me feel better personally. <laughs> anyway, um, that little attitude cost the Son of God his life. In these times, we need to ask God to show us the horror of anything short of his righteous perfection. I remember a friend of mine saw the passion of Christ for the first time, and woof, that is just wow. And she said, this is the first time I realized the cost of that attitude, that action, that word that I thought was, well, not a big deal. That's what it cost. Jesus. I had a, a lady last night in the Tuesday night study that came walking up to me and she said, you know, I, I just, I have to confess this. She said, I just left my job. I'm in a new job. And ever since I left that job a while ago, I have been burdened about something that I'd said or did to one of my coworkers. And she said, it was really a minor little thing. I don't think she even really knew, 
um, and she didn't go into details of what it was, but she said, um, and ever since I left, I have had this guilt hanging over me. I, I just can't, uh, you know, every morning I'll be having my devos and praying or something, and then poof, I remember what I did to that coworker. And she said, again, I don't even know that she was aware. And she said, so I just, just this week, I, I decided I'm gonna write her a letter. And so she wrote a letter to this coworker, and she said, you know, I don't know if she even knows what I'm talking about as far as the action I took, but she said, as soon as I mailed that letter, put it in the mailbox, she said, the relief. I had been mourning my sin, and to anybody else, it might have been a tiny little thing, but to me, I was mourning. I was burdened by it, and when I confessed it, the comfort I felt, the relief I felt, the joy I felt. Wow. Number two, mourning is also grief over sins of the world. What's going on in our world? When we begin to have God's perspective in, on our personal sin, it will produce a sour over the power and the effects of sin in the world. As we look around us and see the conditions around us, we see the devastation that personal sin has caused globally, haven't we? Are we grieving over that? We need to be grieving over that. We need to be grieving over the pain inflicted by broken families, infidelity, pornography, violence. How about children killed and school shootings? Does that cause us grief, sadness? Yes, yes, yes. As our, and as our hearts grieve over the headlines, the news and everything, Jesus says, blessed or approved are you if you mourn because what? You will be comforted. You will be comforted. But it's important to see that mourning over sin is definitely not the vogue way to go in our society today, is it? So what is mourning? that is correct. First, we need to realize, A, mourning is anti-cultural. Anti-cultural. Uh, I don't think there's an office around where people are standing over the coffee machine and saying, I just can't believe how sin is devastating our culture today. I don't think we'll hear that, do you? No, and I think the, the, our culture has done just the opposite. It's gone wild in a, an attempt to avoid it. We have structured, structured our lives to focus on entertainment, noise, amusement, and the focus is always on, okay, whoa, three days away from, from uh, ba uh, weekend, three days away from vacation, and oh, I can forget all this stuff, and wow, escape all this. Wow, wow. The philosophy of the culture is to forget your troubles and do everything you can not to face them. The money, energy, enthusiasm that are expended in entertaining people are an expression of the great aim to get away from this idea of mourning over sin. Mourning over sin. Laughter is essential, yes. Having fun is essential, yes. In fact, Solomon said in Proverbs, a merry heart is good medicine, good medicine. We need that, we need that, but not as an escape, not as an escape. True Christianity manifests itself in what we cry over and what we laugh at. We should examine our hearts to see what we weep at and what we laugh about because B, mourning is a spiritual exercise. In our spiritual life, mourning is not optional. Um, as I was thinking about that, I remember when Tori was in upper elementary school, and I went to pick her up after school one day, <clears throat> and she got in the car, and she was just, just something gravely wrong, and I said, honey, w what's wrong? What, why are you so, did something, what happened at school today? It, it was something, bad happen? And she said, well, we were having our spelling test, and I happened to look over at Ashley's test and noticed that um, I had spelled one of my words wrong. And she said, and so I quickly erased my word and changed it to the right spelling. And she said, um, I, I didn't mean to cheat or anything, Mom, but I, it just sort of happened. And, you know, we didn't want to lessen that blow because it was such a wonderful exercise for the future. So we said, you know what? What we would encourage you to do, Tori, is um, 
when you go into school tomorrow, take your test to her and say, this is what I did. Admit you're wrong. Tell, tell them what happened. Was that overkill? Was that overreacting? Absolutely not, because the life lesson was too important for her to learn. She was grieving over her sin at a little girl level. And it was such an important uh, emotion because we all, as believers, need to experience the intellectual poverty of spirit that we talked about last week. And then the emotional counterpart of grieving over that sin, a mourning. The important question to ask is, how can a believer possibly not mourn the sin that cost our Savior, our mighty Creator, to have to leave his, his home in heaven, become a human, we've talked about this so many times, come and be a human in that era of history, wow, and then ultimately pay, his, pay the penalty for our sin. Again, the, the <clears throat> movie Passion of, of Christ, when the first time we saw that movie, Bob and I said to each other, you know, we need to watch this every Easter so that we can understand the gravity of Good Friday <laughs> and the rejoicing of, um, of Easter Sunday. And so every year we say, okay, it's Good Friday, we need to watch the movie, and we go, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And we've only watched it one time. It was so amazing. And that is, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And the, here's the thing. That is nothing compared to the reality of what Jesus experienced, experiencing the most heinous uh, death penalty experience known to man. Why? Because of our sin. And we need to get a grasp on that. I can, it'll be very interesting to see how Chosen deals with the crucifixion. Wow, interesting. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, it was very. And I hear it was even worse in the European version of it. But anyway, later on the sermon, uh, we will study the Lord's Prayer, and he says, forgive us our sins. And when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, yes, we are forgiven once and for all. We are heaven-bound. But here's the thing. We need to cleanse the dust and grime we collect on the jury, uh, on the journey. And we get a lot, don't we? As we're going through and we're getting cut off on, the, on I-95 or somebody grabs that parking space or things that are a lot more serious than that, we get, we get ugh, and attitudes and thoughts and maybe words. And so we collect grime. We are heaven bound if we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior for sure. We are forgiven totally, completely, and utterly. However, <coughs> We have everyday stuff. And so we need to cleanse that stuff from what we pick up as we're marching through life. Is that the cutest thing you've ever seen? <laughs> and look what it says at the bottom. It says, wash your hooves. Wash them. Because we're going to get stuff all day long. Wash them. Get in that bathtub called prayer and say, Lord, cleanse, cleanse my heart. Cleanse me from that, you know, I know I'm heaven bound. I know you've forgiven me totally, completely, 100%. But, wow, forgive me for that attitude. For, forgive me for those words. Forgive me for, for thinking that or whatever it is. Cleanse me. Purify me. Clean my hooves. Wow. <clears throat> the verb tense used here for mourn in the original language means continuous, continuous. Godly believers perpetually mourn over their sin and therefore perpetually repent of their sins, uh, wanting to cleanse the dirt and grime off their feet at the end of the day or the following morning or whatever. Our sin causes us to be constantly aware of our need for God constantly aware of our need for God. We never get there until heaven. We never get there. Wow. The ongoing morning opens us up to his unspeakable comfort and joy. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. Have that attitude of mourning for the reality of who you are. And guess what? You are going to be blessed beyond measure 
with comfort and joy. Next on your outline, mourning brings comfort. Back to the verse. Blessed are they that, that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Notice that the comfort is actually immediate. The actual sense of the verse is blessed are the mourners, for they will immediately be comforted when, and will continue to be so. Wow. It's an instantaneous thing. It's not like, okay, I'm going to admit, like that woman who wrote the letter from last night's Bible study, it wasn't like three days later she was like, oh, wow, that was great. It was instantaneous. The minute she mailed that letter of confession, <sighs> and she was filled with the comfort of being released from her mourning. How will they be comforted? A, comfort comes through forgiveness. Above all, the basis of comfort is forgiveness. Pe believers are the only people in the world who can be free of guilt because they are the ones who have received the covering of Jesus for their sins. The word they in the original is emphatic, meaning they and they alone are comforted. In other words, believers who have been cleansed of their sin eternally, they're the ones that can receive comfort from the Lord as they mourn over the daily grime and dirt and mud that they pick up as they walk through a fallen world. Wow. Going back to Tori's incident about cheating on her spelling test. Um, her teacher was a very strong believer and was very sensitive to what was going on. And so she said, Tori, very lovingly, I forgive you for that. And she said, but you know, I'm going to have to lower your grade because I know you didn't really mean to cheat, but you cheated. And so she lowered her grade. Sin has its consequences. And, but she lovingly, gently dealt with her. Can I tell you the relief of that little girl that afternoon when she got into the car? She said, Mom, everything's okay. And yeah, I didn't get an A, I got a C, but wow, Mrs. So-and-so forgave me and I'm, I'm okay. And she was such an example of what we're talking about here, that when we mourn our sin, instantaneously the joy of God's comfort invades us. Wow. Isn't that the way God deals with us, like that teacher, gently, lovingly forgives us. And I remember that feeling too, going back to my Shoji incident. That relief, I'm forgiven. Yeah, I did it. I, I was punished for it. I should have been. But wow, wow, I'm forgiven. This forgiveness is also accompanied by changed lives from which comfort springs. Comfort from deep within. B, comfort comes through the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the word uh, in the original language for Holy Spirit means comforter. It literally means coming alongside and comforting us. God's comfort is rational. It comes from the, in the form of his companionship, not rational, relational. Let me say that again. God's comfort is relational and it comes in the form of his companionship through the Holy Spirit. He binds up our so sorrows and consoles us. That is what Jesus promised just before he went to the cross on our behalf in John 14, 16. And here's what he said. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or comforter to be with you forever. And the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the helper is the one that comes alongside and helps us with that forgiving process, the mourning process over uh, our sin. The comfort that God gives is amazing. It is immediate, and it comes to believers alone. And incredibly, it comes from the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're called blessed when we mourn our sin. We will be comforted by God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Because ultimately, see on your outline, comfort comes through salvation. This is in your book, and I think it's very profound. In the words of Chuck Colson, that night, when I sat alone in my car, my own sin, the hatred and evil so deep within me was thrust before my eyes forcibly and painfully. For the first time in my life, I felt unclean, and worst of all, I could not escape. 
in those moments of clarity, I find myself driven irres irresistibly into the arms of the loving God. Wow. Talk about a changed life, right? Wow. Chuck Colson. If we acknowledge that there's nothing within you or me to commend us to God, then we are mourning then we are mourning over our sin. Being in right relationship with God, to God, is the way to comfort. D, comfort comes through hope. Comfort comes through hope. Now, what does that mean? Uh, what it means is that as a Christian looks at the wor world, including himself, it's very unhappy, isn't it? Because we're so imperfect, and we see imperfect things around us. We see horror stories around us and all those things. It, it, it's, it's just, um, it's very unhappy, but, and we can be overwhelmed by all that we see around us and in our lives, but we are comforted, and here it is, by the fact that we're looking forward in hope. Hope. Hope that one day uh, will come with a capital H, hope with a capital H, Jesus has promised to return our knight on a white horse. This is one of my favorite passages in scripture and I want to share it with you. It's uh, Revelation 19 uh, verses 11 and on. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dripped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in five linen, white and pure, are following him on, a, on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, which, uh, which to strike down the nations. And, with, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is someday, how about today, Lord? <laughs> someday he is coming back to retrieve us and right the wrong that causes us such mourning in our lives. Wow, wow, wow. Comfort comes from the hope of Jesus Christ coming back for us. He has promised that sin will be no more, that wrongs will be righted, justice will prevail, and he has promised that we will be like him without sin nature, at all anymore wow does that sound like a plan i love it is that hope absolutely closing question does that give you hope does that give you hope have you asked the lord to cleanse you once and for all and to make you one of his lambs and as you've asked him to cleanse you once and for all have you washed your hooves at the every day to cleanse you from the grime that we pick up in life? Have you placed your hope in these troubling times on the night on his white steed coming for you and me someday? And may it be soon. May it be soon. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that in the midst of so many tragedies, traumas, uh, fearful circumstances, all the things that we have to experience as we go through this fallen world that you are victorious and that the more we view ourselves in reality the more comfort we will receive we thank you that we have the hope that someday we will shed these mortal bodies and be just like you. What a hope. What an amazing thought that we can cling to. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And it's in your mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.